do vaping unveiled part two. Um, so I just would like to welcome everyone today. Thank you for attending. Thank you to the student ambassadors for participating in the second part of our vaping unveiled roundtable. So, um, so last time we focused more on what you students saw in schools and discussed some of the statistics for youth vaping in NYC. This time around, we want to have a very raw dialogue and hear what you think about the smoke screen um, that the tobacco industry uses to keep people smoking and maintain their bottom line, how tobacco use and marketing perpetuates health disparities and inequalities. And finally, we want to hear from you about changes that you think to, that need to be made in order to see real change. So I'm basically going to just briefly introduce myself um, and then I will pass on to uh, my colleague Deidre, uh, uh, Deidre Scully, who um, is co-moderating this roundtable event. And then we will pass it on to the student ambassadors to briefly introduce themselves as well. So my name is um, Alia Kumsani, and I'm the youth program lead at the MCC Office of Community Outreach and Engagement at Wheel Cornell Medicine. Um, Deidre, I would like to pass it on to you. Thank you, Alia, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, as Alia said, I'm Deidre Sully. I am co-moderating this panel of, uh, for the student roundtable. I am the director of NYC Smoke Free, a program of public health solutions, um, where uh, our main goal is really to end the devastating tobacco epidemic in New York City. Um, we do that by a multitude of ways, namely working with the community as well as with you. So um, that's why it's really um, an honor to be here today to help um, moderate the panel and speak with um, some amazing students and hear what they have to say. And I would also just like to say thank you to all of them for, you know, rejoining us for part two. And I think after that, um, we'll have the students inter um, introduce themselves. So Leah, starting with you. Okay. Hello, my name is Leah Brown. I'm from Gaynor McCown from Staten Island. I'm part of Round Talk. Um, and the reason why I was so interested in um, this program is because it was able to like inform people about the health risk of vape and cigarettes too, and how we talk about how it's advertised and how what we should do as like students and how we give out the information to others. Thank you, Leah. And Hi, my name is yes. Hi, my name is Steven Mantello. Um, I go to Staten Island Technical High School. And the reason why I was so interested in this program is because I've always uh, thought that it's uh, overlooked how important advocating against the risks of vaping are. And personally, I've even seen a few of my friends uh, using such e-cigarettes. And I think that just overall, there needs to be more awareness around it. So I wanted to not only learn more, but help spread that awareness. Um, Hasanuti. Hi, my name is Usunato and I'm 15 years old, turning 16, and I'm from Brooklyn, New York. And the reason why I decided to join this program is because I actually never been in a program like this before. And um, I just want to experience more, learn more, because I know this is one of the big impacts in our life right now. Thank you. And Bashira? Hi, my name is Bashira. I'm from Health Professions and Human Services. The reason why I was interested is because I was seeing everyone around me, like my peers and everyone, just using these products and I wanted to fight against it. Thank you. And lastly, Tahmina. Hi, my name is Tamina, and I'm a senior at Belmont Prep High School. Um, I've always been really interested in the field of oncology, which is why I've done a lot of work associated with this field and I've previously been parts of smoking withdrawal campaigns and that is exactly why I wanted to join this to further my work. Thank you very much for that. Um, so kicking off with the first topic of discussion today. So when it comes to advertising and marketing tobacco products, tobacco companies play a significant role in um, spreading misinformation and keeping people addicted. So um, the first question that I have for, for, for the youth ambassadors today is, do any of your friends or family have misconceptions about nicotine addiction? 
a lot of my friends, they don't think nicotine has any like health, real health problems, but we know that it could cause severe brain damage. So they don't really consider the negative effects. And I think that these misconceptions need to be addressed seriously. I definitely agree with Bashira. Um, personally, I know that there, there seems to be some sort of advertisement around vaping e-cigarettes that characterizes it as safer than your normal cigarette. But um, that's really a misconception. A lot of research has shown that it's just as dangerous, if not even more dangerous than a normal cigarette to smoke from an e-cigarette. So I think that's definitely the biggest misconception, not only among friends, but among the media and just widespread that I tend to see about them. Um, and adding on to what Stephen was saying, a lot of my friends who actually um, use a lot of e-cigarettes, they keep saying that it's safer, which is why um, they keep smoking more of those because they have no idea that there's any health issues related to that, which is a large misconception because it comes with a lot of health conditions too. I agree with what everybody has been saying. Um, I noticed like um, now a lot of like teens in high school and everything want to start smoking and that's where they go like to the stores and start getting it. And it's like, they seem that it's very popular because you know, it was for the look, they will post it and everybody was like, cool, you know, what flavor? So it was like a conversation getting going, but they never talk about like what could happen in the long run. Long run. And like, we have been seeing like people going to the hospital, people dying over it, and people are still not making it seem like vaping is bad. And it's very important to tell youth that this stuff could happen when smoking it, because they they only think about the moment, not thinking about the long-term effects. Right. So that was a really good um, recap. And um, I'm going to pull in some of what happened the last time. So thank you, everyone, for um Kind of joining in and answering like that first question and so i just want to give like a, a quick recap so the last time on this um, round table vaping unveiled back in november we discussed a lot about um or focused on you know what u.s students saw in schools based on some of the statistics for youth vaping in nyc you know of course and that coupled with your anecdotal stories and the things that you actually witnessed or saw with your own eyes this time around, we want to have a very raw dialogue and dialogue and hear what you think about the smoke screen that the tobacco industry uses to keep people smoking and maintain their own bottom line um, and how they use marketing that perpetuates health inequities and health disparities. Um, some of you who are part of the NYC Smoke Free Reality Check would have, um, you know, some really good information on that. Um, and even those of you who are not like Tamina where your interest is oncology. So I'm sure some of these things, you know, you've been paying attention to. We also want to, you know, finally like hear from you about the changes that you think could be made or need to be made or the things that we can do to see real change. So um, part of the role of tobacco company is spreading misinformation and keeping people addicted. So I would like to know from some of you if any of your friends and family have misconceptions about nicotine addiction. Uh, if it's all right, I'm going to start. So uh, I definitely think that there's a lot of misconceptions, like I said before, not only in my friends and, and family, maybe, but just on a widespread level. And um, I think something that most people don't realize is a lot of people don't realize how serious addiction is until they know someone who's addicted personally or until they themselves are addicted even. And I think that's a huge problem because many people don't realize that once you get hooked onto something like that, you can't just quit it without um, a lot of effort and trouble going into that. And so it may not be taken as seriously by people who are not addicted because they don't realize that that addiction isn't so easy to just solve right away. Yeah, I agree. And I actually don't want to say too much information about this, but I actually know someone that was addicted with cigarettes and he's still in the hospital for that. I think he'd been in the hospital for about like months, years. I don't even know, but I just know that he used to smoke cigarettes and like we stopped doing that and he continued. And now he's he ended up in the hospital and he's wow. being getting taken care of. And yeah. Um, for me, I was just having a conversation with like my friends who do smoke um vape and everything, to asking them like, can you 
give it up like if i told you like if someone just like took all your vape stuff away and everything then like it's not addicted but you know maybe i could put it down but like when you look at the facts and everything them buying it every week you know that they're addicted to it because they said oh it was low on nicotine that nicotine is still doing something to their bodies making them crave and making them want to continue to keep keep getting these products so it's important to know that there is nicotine in it even if it's just a small doses inside of the vapes that is still gonna affect you and your body i was just gonna add on to steven i know he mentioned that it could be more dangerous than a traditional cigarette because you know you're smoking so much more because you can't really track it with like a regular cigarette since um after you finish one um, stick then you can track it but with the vape then you can't really absolutely so i had a, a follow-up question um for some of you um for those of you who um shared do you think that your friends and family um know um what the addictive part of cigarettes or smoking or vaping is or do, you, do you think they know that it's the nicotine um, and if they do know, is there this, um, I guess it goes back to the first question, like that misconception that they think um, the amount, um, if, if they hear that, oh, it's only this much that, you know, they, they have less of a chance being addicted. Um, yes, yeah, so that's like a big factor. Like we could tell them like, these are what's inside these vapes. And they'd be like, oh, this is little. It's not worse than cigarettes. But like, as studies go on, we see like the negative effects it has on people's body. But they don't, I don't, I feel like they won't care until it happens to them. And like, even trying to explain each in ingredient to them, they don't care because at the end of the day, they're just doing it for looks and to be cool. Um, for my friends, a weird misconception that they have is that um, they're kind of entitled to it because of the stress that they go through at school. So I've, I've a lot of times I've tried telling them that, um, do you know, like there are chemicals in it that are that are going to cause you long-term damage. And they're like, oh, when we're old, we're going to have health conditions anyway. So might as well just add up to it because right now I need it. Like they have this urge that keeps them want to keep going. So that's one big thing that they have in common. I want to bring up something that Leah said before. Um, I, I She mentioned how a lot of uh, friends or maybe people that she knows uh, vape and decide to say that they're not addicted, but they don't realize that they are. And I think that's uh, another common misconception with uh, vaping and the use of e-cigarettes because I personally have had friends that have said that they're not addicted, but when when they're buying it so often and always craving it and, and using it whenever they can, I think it's 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 scary because a lot of kids don't know a lot about addiction and a lot of kids are uneducated on the actual effects of these e-cigarettes. So the combination of those two things makes it really dangerous for them because they don't think that they're addicted. When they think of a drug addiction, they think of something that like they might think of pills or they might think of more intense drugs that uh, people get, get addicted to when they're older or whatever it may be. But people just refuse to correlate these e-cigarettes with addiction because one, they may not see or notice any long-term effects in their lives yet because they're still so young and using them and they might've not been using them long enough to realize these long-term effects. And at the same time, they just don't classify them as the same thing as other harmful drugs. Um, I agree so much with you because it's all about cigarettes have been here for a long time. So we have a study. We have seen what can happen when you're old and the effects on cigarettes. But because e-cigarettes are so new, we don't have enough research or information on e-cigarettes to inform these people about what's going to happen 50 years from now. So it's all about needing to gather reach, research to understand and teach people about the problems of e-cigarettes. Yeah, I would like to add on, and this also got something to do with the flavor, because I know that like every type, there's a lot of different type of vapes, and they have different type of flavors. So say, for example, like say for example, cherry candy. Um, some people might be addicted addicted to that and eat that continuing, you know. But like in vaping too, like there's different flavors. There's I heard that there's cher different flavors and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for um, that, I also Stephen. think it's more socially acceptable to have a nicotine addiction because people like other people around you um, are also doing it. So people think 
you know, it's fine since other people are doing it, but that's not the and Stephen, I think you made a very valid point about people not knowing what exactly addiction is and not associating it with necessarily vaping. Um, so yeah, educating the youth about what signs to look out for definitely is something that could be done to kind of help bring about change. Um, so just moving on to the topic, you know, discussing more about what can be done, what practical measures can we take um, to kind of bring about change, real change, uh, when it comes to kind of reducing the use of vapes among youth. Um, so when it comes to restricting mar marketing efforts, based on what you know, what you've learned about tobacco use and addiction, as it relates to marketing, um, what are some suggestions that you think, um, being youth yourselves, um, you would kind of try and implement to address tobacco company marketing because we all know there's a lot of misconceptions being advertised and marketed you know um vapes being seen as cool like you you mentioned as well um you know celebrities using it to kind of advocate for you know how cool it looks um so yeah do, do you have any practical measures that you think would be worth implementing to kind of bring about this change when it comes to advertising and marketing in particular? I think that people should do more research on um, vaping and stuff because like advertising sometimes it could be a lie and advertising could also be one-sided so you wouldn't know sometimes they'll be given like right information and sometimes they'll just be given it for their product or something to a muscle comb so like people could use it and stuff. So it's very important for people to do their research and give accurate information because if they're not given accurate information, they're um, they're affecting other people. Um, in my opinion, one thing that could be done was uh, that, that could be done is um, decreasing availability because I feel like because it's so widely available. Um, people are not like people who are selling it are not even looking at the age ranges or anything and they're just selling it for the sake of it and obviously for profiting off of it and decreasing availability would have a strict age guideline that the sellers could follow which could definitely be a good start i guess um in my school my teacher implanted um for health talking about e-cigarettes because this was never like a big discussion before because since um e-vape is so new so he implanted um talking about vape talking about the chemicals inside and also like telling you what could happen um the risk and also um like the day-to-day -day, how much you're spending because when you look at how much people are buying these products you see how much money you're losing out so that also could make people like oh no let me stay away and keep my money i think there needs to be more regulation on social media marketing because you see with the rise of social media apps like instagram and tiktok more people are even selling it on those apps and those apps are primarily for younger audiences. So they're gonna get hooked and wanna try out these like anyone else. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with everything that everyone said. There's there's a lot of things that I think need to be done before um, real change is made. Uh, for one, I know uh, someone mentioned flavors earlier. I think that the removal of flavors is very important because that's something that definitely appeals kids to maybe try it out, make that first step and try it just for fun because you know, it's appealing. Those flavors are pretty much marketing towards kids our age or even younger. Um, the other thing about raising prices, I think that's definitely important because you know, raising prices, maybe even like dramatically raising prices would make a difference in the amount of people that are getting their hands on these things. And I think that another thing, I was actually reading about this earlier. Um, I've heard that about 70% of middle schoolers have um, been exposed to an ad for e-cigarettes or vape devices at some point. And the fact that they're still in middle school is a little bit crazy to me. And I think that uh, it, they definitely have to stop being uh, advertised and sold in such um, accessible places, in my opinion, because I know that when I go to a deli or when I go to a 7-Eleven, I always see that they're being sold behind the counter. And the truth, the, the ugly truth is that sometimes the people working at these delis or 7-Eleven might sell it to somebody who's underage if they offer maybe extra money for it or something like that. So I definitely think that the fact that they're so easily accessible 
needs to change, even though they might not necessarily be accessible to underage kids all the time. Just the fact that they're so easily accessible and the advertisements are everywhere pretty much. I think that definitely needs to be the biggest change. Um, I would also like to bring up a point that Bashira, I think, mentioned um, about it being socially, um, like socially acceptable, like how people think it's cool to be a part of it. So what what we could educate them is instead of appreciating and applauding at them being cool and smoking, we could kind of like break that norm and title it with something severely wrong, which would kind of stop people from following that trend of being smoke, being a smoker. Um, when I was younger, I used to see like the cigarette commercials of people like, you know, them losing their voice or like their lung collapsing. And that was like a big eye awakener for me. Like I would never pick up cigarettes. So I feel like videos like that should be put on TV on the effects on vape because you don't normally see on TV, oh, vape does this. You mostly see only cigarettes. And it's bad to show like only one thing can go bad for you when there's multiple things could go bad for you when picking up these devices. Absolutely. Um, and I heard one of you mention flavors, which is awesome because it's a great segue into the next question um, regarding flavors and how we move um, with that. Um, um, first, I do want to say in New York City, at least, we do have um, what we call Tobacco 21. So someone mentioned age restrictions. And so in New York City, you actually, in order to legally purchase tobacco products, you have, whether it be vape or conventional products, you have to be 21 years old. So, you know, from the good work that, you know, our reality check students do, as well as our partners and community members, you know, we were able to, you know, spread education to, you know, to the community to say why this is necessary and why it's good. And so now we have that. And so speaking of flavors, it's kind of along the same lines when we come when it comes to education and talking to communities, right? So recently, both New York State and New York City have prohibited the sale of um, flavors for e-cigs or vaping, but they left out one critical flavor and that's menthol um, when it comes to your traditional or um, conventional um, cigarettes. So uh, what I wanna know from you guys um, is, um, and we'll, we'll have this conversation about the flavors, it kind of branches into a few things, right? So the first thing that I want to uh, us to kind of like go around and talk about is what were or are some of the popular flavors that you remember when we when you were still like you know physically going to school because we know everything now is virtual and we're all like looking at each other through boxes so when you were still in school or even now like compared to now like how you do it, how you are able to interact with friends or peers you know what are some of the popular flavors that you have seen Definitely fruits. Um, some of my friends would, they would always bring up different fruits and they'd be like, oh, I have mango. Oh, I have strawberry. I want to try yours. And they just swap it and different sorts of fruits. I remember. Um, for me, it's mostly like mint flavors, like winter breeze or like minty something. I've heard of like sugary ones, like cotton candy and like bright, when you think of it, like bright children's stuff. Yeah, I definitely agree with Tom. You know, the fruit flavors seem to be really popular. I've heard a lot about mango for some reason. So, yeah, I will say cherry, like fruits and stuff. And I also have a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, like, why can't? Because we have the power to get rid of vape, vape. We cannot get rid of none of those stuff. So why can't they just ban it in our city or in the whole country? So when it comes to certain things like that, um, it's um, it's a consumerism and capitalism, right? So it's a product that is for right now, it's legal. So um, it, it creates what we call a slippery slope when you just start banning things, you know, without just cause and things like that. However, I think, you know, with the things that we have seen when it comes to vaping and the devastation that it has caused, we know a few years ago that we saw a lot of people get really, really sick. Um, a lot of people died when it came to how they were using um, the vaping. There's still a lot of things that are unknown. So one place that we're definitely at is like, you know, there needs to be more research before this, this type of product is allowed to kind of stay on the market because there's just too many unknowns. 
So it, it, so we have to think about, okay, well, how do we kind of curtail some of the things that are happening? And so um, when I mentioned earlier about the flavors, that's one thing. You make things less attractive. So that way people aren't just, you know, they're not using them. So, um, so that, so that there, there's just the, the different ways in which we have to kind of move, especially within uh, the different laws that we have also within this country, right? So, what, so something that is unique to the United States um, is the freedom of speech. And so what they do is um, advertising when it comes to advertising in corporations, because corporations are considered entities or people like you and I, um, they also have a freedom of speech. And so a lot of times that kind of technicality can get in the way when we're trying to um, do things that are for the greater good or for the, you know, for public health. So this is why the education is important. You know, we educate young people, we educate communities to say, this is what's really going on with a, with a, with a product like this. until so we get to the point where the people may even call for like, you know, to say, we don't need this anymore. So it's, it's just a way that we have to, you know, we have to be careful about how we just, you know, ban things or prohibit things. There has to be a, a process of like just cause to do that. Um, and just to add to that, it's um, there's a certain agency that each person has over their health. And it's kind of in a way, like Deidre said, it's a slippery slope because on one hand, you need to give people the choice um, to make decisions when it comes to their health. But, and at the same time, you need to regulate certain, you know, certain things that may be harmful or dangerous. So and when it comes to vaping, there's a number of other things, you know, that people consume that are deemed as being unhealthy or dangerous so it's you know you start to question okay so if we ban this you know you know how far do we go and then how how much is that you know kind of like impeding on people's personal choice um so yeah it's a quite it's an interesting question and it's very complex in terms of you know how we navigate around it i'd say um so just um kind of moving on um to just yeah just we, we've just talked about flavors and tobacco and, you know, this, these marketing campaigns and how they hijack, you know, set, you know, the senses, our senses, our sense of smell, taste, etc. cetera. So um, just in one word, how would you summarize um, how you feel in regards to a certain flavor of tobacco? So for example, um, something like menthol would make it feel, you know, make you feel fresh, bit, make you feel a little bit more kind of like awake. Um, so do you have any particular kind of feelings towards um, how certain flavors would make you kind of feel? It's a bit of a tough question, but I think like maybe sweeter flavors would um, I don't know, make someone a little bit more hyper. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Any other suggestions? Um, also with like brighter colors, like cotton candy, I think, like Stephen said, um, happier and maybe. Mm -hmm. There's no right answer to this. It's just in, t just in general and what you think about certain flavors and how, you know, how they would be more um, attractive to certain, um, certain users. I mean, I forgot to mention it before, but I guess like just in general, I know a lot of kids since a lot of kids like look to it and look to their uh, look to e-cigarettes for like de-stressing or they think that they're becoming less stressed out by taking them, maybe they would just take whatever flavor they like the most and like, you know, that would make them less stressed out in their mind or maybe there's a placebo effect involved, whatever it might be. So uh, yeah, just overall, maybe just more, more calm. Mm -hmm. Any other? And also berry and blueberry because those those are sweet foods. Yeah, so it's interesting, you know. Um, I think to uh, Dr. Konsani's point, you know, you brought out some really good things, like you know, when you said the colors, um, you know, it makes you feel like maybe it makes you feel happy, or you know, oh, it makes me feel de-stressed. Um, uh, the the mint, you know, that's the whole thing about mint. Oh, it's cooling, refreshing. So there's definitely you know, some psychological pulling and, and, and tapping into emotion when it comes to, you know, cigarette use and tobacco and nicotine. And it's all really a trick and the tobacco companies have been doing this for years. And so 
back to the kind of going back to the question asked by Husan. So this is Husanatu, this is why it's really important to do education and have like in health intervention, health promotion campaigns so that people can make informed decisions about their health. Um, so I wanna like um, kind of tease on the, the idea of the flavors really quickly. And we mentioned earlier, like one of the things that we wanted to talk about before we um, head out is making sure we hit on the topic of health equity, right? So I'm sure, um, especially since um, 2020, we've all been, you know, kind of in the midst of the crazy that's been COVID-19 and we see what's going on. And really like public health has been at the forefront of, of, of everything. So I'm sure some of you have heard uh, about the term health equity, it's crossed over. So before we go deeper into the conversation, I like to like get a sense of and go around to see like what your, you know, what you think about health equity, health equity, like um, how do you define it? Like, do you know what it is? Um, and, and again, just, you know, just round robin to say like what it is and then we'll kind of get into it. I think of it of like recognizing everyone's situation to make like a middle ground for everyone. Um, I think it's about like um, everybody having a fair, what's it called, opportunity to good health. So like we have an option to get these products, but if you don't want to get it, then you're benefiting your own health. Right, I definitely agree with uh, Leah on that, that uh, even though you have the opportunity to get it, you don't necessarily have to because you know, you're looking out for yourself and each person can make that decision for themselves. Um, I will say communication because communication is also key. Like, like for example, people like for example, um, counselors, and then um, the person. I don't know how to say this, but um, not trying to like force them to um, force them to tell you like what's happening, like talk to them as like a friend or something, because sometimes people just trying to like force you to get information out of it. And I personally experienced that too, because it's harder for me to like talk to someone when they're forcing me to tell them the main stuff and stuff. And I like, it's, there is like a process, like you have to take, you have to take time with it. And yeah. Does anyone have anything else to add? So I'm going to go over like the official definition, but that was really good. I think all of you hit on pieces of what um, health equity is. And it really is, um, it means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. So it's pulling on what uh, Dr. Consani said earlier, like having an agency over your own health. And sometimes that also means, you know, removing barriers that are in place that, that prevent people from optimal health. So that's some, sometimes it's like poverty, um, poverty uh, discrimination or other, you know, consequences. Um, so just to like sum it up, it's making sure that groups, populations or communities have what and how much of what they need to achieve optimum health. So it's not the same as like equality because equality would be like, you know, making sure everybody has the same amount, but some people need more than the other and some, some people need less. So the equity is making sure that it's balanced to what people need to have optimum health. So that being said, um, when we talk about flavors and, and just how the tobacco industry has been operating in general, um, what many don't realize is that um, up front, like many of the movements of tobacco industry, they only serve to keep certain populations in the dark and further from obtaining that optimal health. And so an example of that is uh, the flavors and menthol flavored tobacco and how it affects young people and people of color, specifically African-American. So when it comes to young people such as yourself, Menthol actually is the flavor initiator. So I understand like, you know, um, when it comes to the vaping, the fruity flavors were like kind of number one. And I heard mango was like a big thing, but um, to when I think it was Leah that said, you know, she, she knew people who, who used mint and that's not a mistake. That's not, that's not it by accident. Mint is um, in the vaping is the second highest. And that's because 
it even like just like with the traditional cigarettes, it presents this misconception of safe smoking because it opens you up and it makes you feel fresh. So when you think about menthol, it's derived from the mint plant. And, and what other things do you know that include mint? There's candy, there's medicine. So like when we think of peppermints and candy canes, all of that and you know includes mint. And so we know what it feels like when we when we use that. And menthol is using a lot of things, your toothpaste, your mouthwash. So it's also a familiar flavor to all of us. So um, the problem with that is it creates health disparities or health inequities among young people because they're using the mint to kind of initiate smoking um, or vaping and also African-Americans. So what are some of your thoughts on how big tobacco you know, perpetuates these health inequities and health disparities? Now that you have a definition of health inequity and you know, pulling on what you know from um, the, the actions of big tobacco, what are your thoughts on how they perpetuate this? The first thing that comes to mind for me, and this might be a little bit off and it might not have been what you're going for, but for some reason, the first thing that came to mind to me was um, since you discussed how health equity has to do with everyone who needs, uh, who has health needs, meets their sufficient health needs, and even though people have different health needs on different levels, everyone gets it met. So I was thinking that maybe if some people don't have access to, say, uh, if you have somebody who is depressed or overly stressed out or has anxiety, and they may not have access to, um, for whatever reason it may be, if they do not have access to, say, the proper medication that they might need, or they might not even know that they need medication in the first place because they don't have access to a doctor, they might uh, they might gravitate towards e-cigarettes, for example, or any other products that maybe they can get their hands on more easily that are advertised to, you know, de-stress or try this, you, you'll, it'll help your anxiety. So I think that that definitely... Uh, that definitely shows how these e-cigarettes relate to health equity because without achieving health equity, the use of e-cigarettes and the exposure to e-cigarettes might increase or we might know it is already increasing. Yeah, I agree and I would like to add on. I was I was thinking the same thing too. I was like, some people might think it's like a medicine or something or like, cause like for example, like people say like weed is like a medicine for um, other people. And like probably like you never know like these type of vapes like mint vape it could probably be a medicine but like you never know. Um, I would like to agree. I feel like these companies are confusing um regular medicine with vapes and making them very similar. Like I know like one medicine when I was younger was like a bubble gum medicine, and I would be like happy because you know it was like a a medicine that I won't like, you know, be like, ew, that's disgusting. But they're confusing that with bad products and making it more acceptable to younger kids. So like the brownie, the mint, the um, bubble gum too, could like confuse somebody with your mental health. And with like, you know, regular stuff like this is bad for you when they're trying to say, oh, this is good. This is going to make you feel relaxed and calm when really is doing damage to your body. Yeah, I definitely agree with what everyone's saying. Um, I think that also by using these like childish kind of names and exotic flavors, they're able to get in the younger generation while telling them a false narrative that it's going to help their stress and all this stuff. Okay, um, so just moving on to the last kind of question and, and just touching upon what you guys said when it comes to health equity. So yeah, um, I think Stephen mentioned something on the lines of, so you've got to also remember that people that come from economic disadvantaged backgrounds will also not have access, may not have, have access to the information. Um, they may be more, um, you know, seeing that they have all these misconceptions and what they see on like advertising marketing they may be more susceptible they may not have um, access to um, you know as good healthcare service as someone who economically is um, more at an advantage so that's something definitely to think about when it comes to health equity in particular but um, just drawing on some examples of you know what we've talked about now in regards to health equities and disparities have you would you would you i mean can you share any kind of experiences that you may have had in your schools 
um, or in your community where this has been something that now that you understand more about the health equity connection um, has been something you've witnessed yourself? Well, though I, um, though I don't have anything on the top of my head that I think I, I have witnessed, uh, I just want to say that it is likely that I, I, I witnessed it without realizing maybe. Um, maybe I've seen some of my friends, um, like if a, anybody I know using e-cigarettes, maybe for instance, depending on the circumstances that they're living under, depending on whatever it might be, that might be preventing them from getting proper help that they actually need for say mental health issues, whether it's anxiety, depression, or any any type of mental health issue. Maybe um, they don't have access to uh, a doctor or a therapist or whatever it might be for any reason, whether it's because of their parents or whether it's uh, whatever it is. I think that these the use of these e-cigarettes and the vapes, I might've not even realized that they're using it for that reason because they, they feel like it's the only thing they have to, um, you know, help them calm down, help them, you know, de-stress. And I, I know I mentioned a bit of a placebo effect earlier. I think that there's definitely a placebo effect behind it because um, there's, you know, I wouldn't know personally, but I feel like these uh, products are advertised to make it seem like that only to gravitate an audience towards them, not because it actually helps the people that use it. And I will say I witnessed, because I remember one time I was going to like a grocery store and... The worker there, he was vaping, right? And I was with like a group of my friends, and then one of them just asked for um, the vaping. I think it's like a pen or something. They asked, and then they was just passing it around, just doing it. And then me and my other friend, we was like, "Oh, that's not cool. I should not be doing that. Yeah, even sharing the same thing." And then also, there was like, "It's nothing. It tastes like blueberry or something like that." And I was like, mm, "I'm not doing that." Um, what I noticed is like, cause I go to school like very far from where I live. So I seen kids from my school come all the way into like, you know, the smoke shops and every, um, like by like, you know, poor neighborhoods to go buy these stuff. So like they would travel very far just to get something that's not even going to last them for a long time or something, something that's going to hurt them in the long run. Um, I like how what Leah said and I want to add on. I think that also advertising is more common in these poor neighborhoods rather than the rich. And it's used to like lure in um, more customers from the poor areas because they know that they'll be hooked. Um, just lastly, adding on to what Bashir was saying, um, I will just gear it towards a little bit of an international point of view. Um, because I recently moved here, it hasn't been too long. I have seen, um, I come from a developing country where there's a lot of children from economically disadvantaged backgrounds who just smoke around their parents too, because even their parents don't have that kind of an education. And they're kind of okay with it because they don't, because they themselves do it. So their children think it's okay because my parents do it, which is why they keep doing it. And because they don't have access to that to that education and to the long-term effects that are gonna that are gonna harm them they just keep doing it and that is one big point about the health equity that is missing from there um I agree so much with you because I was just talking to my friend and she was like her mom knows that she smokes these devices and her mom is not um from the U.S. she's from um Spain and I was like shocked. I was like, wow, your mom let you smoke in front of me. She's like, yeah, she doesn't have a big deal. But I bet that her mom doesn't know the full information about it and doesn't know like what could happen to her daughter in the long run. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like a lot of parents, family that comes from different backgrounds is not really educated like that. Yeah, they're not really educated and they think everything is good or think everything is bad or something like that. Yeah, and that's, I think that's, that raises the important, you know, kind of position and responsibility that as, you know, a youth ambassador or as someone um, who has access to this information, it's important that we get it out there so that we can kind of have this, these kind of discussions amongst families and communities and this exchange, which I think is really, really important because, you know, by educating the youth, making them more aware, they can in turn kind of share that message with their parents, should they not be, you know, um, in the know when it comes to kind of the dangers of, for example, vaping. 
Um, so that's a really, really good point you raised, uh, Tahmina. Um, I, I want to say thank you to all of you for bringing that up. Um, I think um, if I could pull like three words out of that that you you know definitely hit, touched on is that it's communities, family, and culture, and it plays a big part into like how we learn things, right, and what we do when we come out into the world, and and then it also plays a big role in how when when things are done like in a mass society, how we have to kind of filter those things, right? So that we make sure that the younger generation, you know, doesn't get all that that muck and grime. So yes, the, and that's why the education is really, really important. And just also to add to that, it's intergenerational, isn't it? The education. Um, so it moves within generations. So you educate one generation and they ultimately will have the power and agency to kind of um, you know, allow that message to progress on. Um, so yeah, it's really, really important. Yeah, and I'll also like to add on because like sometimes I think they know more stuff. They know they know more stuff than their kids. And sometimes we know more stuff than them. Like it's different. They probably know more stuff in their background. We know more stuff in ours. Mm -hmm. What we're learning basically. So I think that pretty much covers um, all the topics of discussion for today's roundtable. Is as you know, it's really really great to have you all on board and sharing your experiences and raising such really really good points of discussion for us all to go back and think about um, in terms of you know how we can individually um, try and advocate for you know a healthy living, um, youth against vaping. Um, yeah, it's all very, very interesting. And I think it's been a really productive discussion. Um, so I just wanted to add before we close, I know we did say that we were going to announce the social media challenge winners on this round table. However, due to the volume and number that we've received in terms of entries, um, we will be announcing um, in the coming days who the top three winners from the first round table are and they will be receiving their $75 vouchers. And we also will be announcing the top three winners um, for the second round table as well. So just keep checking your emails. Uh, you may get an email in the next coming day just to letting you know that you are a winner and you will um, be receiving your voucher. But um, just wanted to thank everyone for attending today, all the student ambassadors who you know took the time out to join us in this discussion and without whom we wouldn't have had this discussion and insight. So really, really thank you for that. And to Deirdre, Kim, Anushka, all the organizers that have been you know, on board in the background, a really big thank you to all of you for making this happen today. Yes, same here. Thank you to everyone. Um, Alia, thank you for reaching out to me to have me do this with you. This was awesome. And thank you to all the students. Like, I think your input is always so valuable um, because it, it kind of keeps us on our toes so that we can do our jobs a lot better.